I came here back in 1960 as a young teacher and it was at a time there was a real fear that uh, all the Māori arts were going to be lost or were on the decline and uh, the education, the Department of Education had a team of Māori advisors with the, under Gordon Tovey they had Buru Walters carving, they had Paramatic, they had Kathy Brown Raranga, but there was a whole group of them, Sandy Adsit who did Mahi Toy. But they went around to, uh, mainly at that time, was the native schools, Māori schools, teaching the teachers, taking the teachers for classes. Because it was on a decline, they thought they were going to lose it all. I was fortunate at the time that our principal, Marewa McConnell, at the Hipara School, she was part of that team. I think she would have been the queer of that team. So we were lucky because those people, they stayed at our school lots of times. And that's probably where I really, where this all started for me for weaving. I can remember Auntie Rongo Pene, that was Lydia's mother, Uncle Simon's mother, uh, but it was and Mum Ngauma, I can remember those old queers doing Fariki. And I came with Kath Brown, but it was like this, she only came not to so much show them what to do, but just to weave alongside them. And at, after a while they sort of accepted her and they picked up a lot of tricks from her actually. Tenakotu Katoa, Ko Wendy's Bull Takawanua. And it's wonderful to be here and actually contribute to the Matariki um, kōpapa around weaving. It, for me, one of the reasons when Auntie Putty asked, asked me or invited me to come and do this was that it's me giving back. And um, my journey's been a long journey as a weaver and I always feel indebted to what was given to me. So I see opportunities to give back. In the early 1980s, when I decided we'd, I'd come to Northland and was living on the land and part of living on the land was being in contact with the things around me and flax was one of them and kia kia, kia kia was in the bush where I lived and that became a really important part of who I was, just understanding the things around me and part of that also became understanding iwi Māori and so I started going along to Te Rarua Marae and of course I met those lovely women, Auntie Martha and Auntie Totty, Auntie Riddle. And their hearts opened to me and I really am still indebted to that. And they said, girl, why don't you actually become a weaver? And I've never been particularly creative. Um, I'm a very physical person, you put me in the bush, I'm happy. Um, put me on the farm, give me a horse to break in, I'm cool. But as far as with my hands and creating, and I thought, ah, I'm not going to be able to do this. So I went along to weaving lessons with these women, and they gave, and they gave, and they gave. And I saw them with children, with, with older women, with men, and they were just wanting to share what they had, share the knowledge they had. When Te Rarawa Marae started all their mahi, auntie, with Auntie Martha and Auntie Flory, and I remember going there in and out because we were part of the Muri Whenua Kapahaka group and um, we had to all do our own pupus there or had to help do our pupus and that was working alongside Viv Gregory but there was a whole lot of them there was a whole lot of things happening at Te Rarua Marae at that time uh, also at the same time I'm aware that there was things happening up in Te Hapua uh, Ko Te Whenua Ko uh, uh, Rangitoto ki te tonga te motu, ko te moana o Rokawa te moana, ko whakatū te marae, no te iwi o te iwi a hau. 
Uh, kia ora koutou. I was part of a group called the uh, Auckland Committee on Racism and Discrimination. And we, we had already formed a friendship with Sana, uh, Sana Murray, uh, bef- you know, uh, before that. But she told us about the struggle to retain the land at Kapawairua and um, the injunction she took out to uh, to stop the uh, the government taking that land. And we thought we would go to Tahapua and, uh, and give her some support. And we did that. And... Uh, when we did, I guess it didn't take us long to see the sort of uh, – this is 1977, so it was the time that just a couple of years after Fina Cooper had, uh, had started the land march. And so we could see that the economic situation and the, 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 the social conditions in Tahapua weren't the greatest. Um, not much work, not a lot of money. Um, and Sana had this idea, really, that you could put it all together. She wanted to retain, she was very keen to retain the traditional knowledge and traditional skills. We started a program to create work for Te Hapua pe- women and for the people too, because there were no jobs. And um, the Labour Department decided to give us a funding to teach a group of women, all of us, and there's a lot that have passed on and a lot are absent to create work for Te Hapua, so we, we started to learn how to weave. They were taught by Auntie Netta, her grandmother, and Auntie Mary uh, Tokiri Neho, and um, some of the weavers and sana, weavers who still had the skills and they taught the younger women and then we were selling the, the, the kits in, in, in Auckland. I'm uh, Huya Cooper. My grandmother, Nita, Nita Prane, she was uh, the tutor for the, um, the weavers. And uh, to be honest, if I wasn't paid to learn, I don't think I would have ever learned how to weave. We didn't ever take any commission or anything, so we used to get... Well, in those days, it was paper rubbish bags full of, full of beautiful weaving from, you know, some of the loveliest weaving from, uh, uh, from Saudi uh, Lazarus, um, uh, Emily Lazarus, or from uh, Irana Lazarus and Sana and Auntie Netta and, and then the younger ones. We got them sent through to us in Auckland, and Ulla and I would take them around to the different shops, the music. Nanny used to stay in the flats by our marae, and we were... Um, and she'll weave, weave and weave. And um, during a tangi, I remember this part, Kefala coming over, and I said, and he was talking to me about her uh, kites. And, and then I realised it was, he introduced himself as Oliver. Oliver, that's how he met our grandmother. I remember Auntie Netta, she told us she was selling a boiled flax kete. Um, to uh, modern bags on Karangahapi Road. That was back in the 19, early 1970s, and she sold it to them for, I think, five dollars, and they sold it for ten dollars. I know it seems it seems uh, terrible now, but at the time, uh, it provided actually um, a basis, I suppose, to grow from. And um, uh, you know, when that Te Maori exhibition yeah. went to New York and the United States. Yeah, Alice Palmer, she went over and she they wanted some weavers to go and do some weaving at the same time. And Alice Palmer went from Tahapua to, uh, to New York to um, take part in that exhibition. So that was very exciting for, you know, for the Tahapua people. Yeah. That's Tokiri Neho and Lutia. Neho was our sister-in-law and she was a, a gun that weaving the, um, the green kettles. And so I still didn't learn too from them. Um, people would come and say, oh, do you know how to make a... I said, no, sorry, you know. And um, behind the walls, my time, they would have little things to say about me, but I thought I'll try and learn by myself. But then when we got into the group, we all learned to, to win. And... I think we're still learning too, you know. Mm-hmm.
Well, you don't see any of us going around with a kitty. Because <laughs> <laughs> they ask you said, to point. If anyone asks, uh, oh, you can't say no, you know. <laughs> so, uh, just give me a plastic bag so you tip all your things you do and give them whatever they ask for. You know? At the time, Netta and her husband, um, uh, Uncle Jerry, uh, Jer they were the sort of, I suppose, they were the main kaumatua for the marae at, uh, in Tahapua, along with uh, Tokiri Neho, um, Josephine's, mo Josephine's mother-in-law. Um, Alice has got a sister, Huya, and Huya was part of that, and so was Raywin. Raywin Brown lives in Auckland, but she was, she was sitting in that, she was part of that, uh, that weaver's group right from the beginning, sitting in the whare at Tahapua. And um, one one more thing, we, we we managed to raise enough money to put up a building, a craft centre in Tahapua, and it's still there. Although I'm not sure it's used for for weaving now, but um, but it was nice to be able to get that sort of some funding, and it all came from these women's mahi. Yeah, but because a lot of the young ones went away, like Mei Mei and Hui and them, um, very few of us were left back home, so was cold down in the building, so we'd use our homes and use our building. Um, we're just going to go home and go back into weaving now that they've come back into Te Hapu and carry it on. And there's a lot of young mothers want to learn too, so we don't want it to fade out. We're going to share our knowledge to our mokopunas and the children. And that's what we do, Millie and I, we take the school children for, um, to teach them how to weave. And then we formed a weavers um, committee, a Te Rarua weavers committee, and um, I didn't put my hand up, but I became secretary of that committee, um, which was cool, that was cool. And we organised a lot of trips around New Zealand um, to different weavers hui, and I can still remember the, the trip to Titiko. Um, we had a van really full, and Uncle Viv Gregory was with us as well. And I'm not a smoker. And I was in that van, and there were all these smokers all the way to Titiko. And I'm going, oh, am I going to be able to survive this trip? That was one of the first big ones we did. Um, but it was cool, and honestly, down there, just being with some of the other national weavers and re realising how special these women from up here were, um, both in their preparedness to give and also in their skills. Uh, so that weavers committee did some great things and that was a way of kind of holding people together a little bit as well, other than the workshops, because sometimes with, with the public workshops people came in and they, they learnt and, and then maybe you didn't see them again. You know, they did what they felt they wanted to do and that was enough. And with Uncle Viv as well, he was so he was so concerned about actually losing the good flax varieties, the, the named varieties, and um, wanting to make sure that people did know and people who were going to actually keep that information and that knowledge really did know. And so there was quite a a strong emphasis on ensuring that things were passed on. Uh, some of the experimental stuff um, for me was really interesting and Auntie Martha was very traditional in her weaving and oh, it was all straight lines. Boy, girl, if you didn't do a straight line, you, you, were in, you undid it. <laughs> but that was cool, you know, it gave me some discipline that I really needed because I tend to do things very fast. My life is a very busy life and um, you know to fit things in I've got to kind of get onto it and get it done. Um, working with the kutta was really exciting and, and being able to share that with my family was neat too because my husband and my very young son at that stage were able to come out with me and pick and um, prepare the kutta and put it in the dark and, and then get it sufficiently dry so that we could weave with it. And weaving some of the mats that we wove and things in those days was just wonderful. And it was, it was almost, I don't know, not hypnotic, but almost meditative. You know, just weaving something quite big where you're just 
doing something over and over again and either going in a big circle, because often the mats were circular, that we were weaving with the kutu, or that I was weaving, um, was really calming. And um, in my busy world, it was quite therapeutic in a way. I can remember, I have, I have a couple of photos, and one of them is of Auntie Riddle um, stirring the copper with the flax in it and, and getting everything all dyed up. And all of the photos that I've seen of Auntie Riddle, when she's doing anything with flax or weaving, she's got the hugest smile. And when I was looking for a few photos to, to lend you, I'm thinking, my goodness, this was so important for this woman. You know, she just put her life and her heart into it. And it's, it's not just physically doing something, it is putting your heart into it. And um, in those days, there wasn't a lot of kite and things like that for sale. And there was the encouragement to do some of this work for sale. But it was so hard because you did, you put your heart into it. You know, and, and I can remember in those early days um, picking a little bit of hoheria and going, okay, now what can I weave for this? It's this tiny little bit. And thinking, well, I'll weave this tiny little, like a little purse. So I wove this delicate little purse and Auntie Martha says, you're going to sell that girl? And I said, no way. <laughs> you know, I, there's no way I could ever, ever sell anything made out of some of the resources because they are so special. And with me, with my really strong connection with the forest and with the things in the forest and, and looking after kiwi and, and kukupa, um, I always felt like I could never sell um, kia, anything I made out of kia kia. The kia kia was something that was kind of me and the forest and it was that connection. And it wasn't something that I could ever sell. Whereas harakiki, korari, uh, yeah. I could do that, um, but certainly the hoheri and the kia kia. That was just that level that kind of was a bit too special um, to let go. So to some extent slowed down a little bit in 1990 when the waka tinana was, was built. And Uncle Ross said to me, he said, we want this waka not to be a, a waka taua, but a waka that is an even older traditional walker, a travelling walker. And um, we want sails on it. And everyone kind of looks sideways and goes, Ooh, how are we going to design these sails? And Ross says to me, he says, well, you can do research, girl. You, you, you go and work it out and then share it with the expert weavers. Share your research knowledge with the expert weavers, which is, of course was Auntie Martha and Dede and, and Auntie Riddle. And um, so I did a lot of research. Uh, when the corridor about building the waka, I remember the hui they had here. They had quite a big hui here. People from all over Te Tokara were here, Kaumatua. And they were talking about uh, what they were going to name the waka. And uh, it was really uh, a, a, an experience that uh, <clears throat> one's never likely to forget. One. So we had to work out how we were going to actually create sales. So that weavers committee that I talked about previously, kind of we all sat down, we worked out what are we going to do? How are we going to do the joins? Um, are we going to do joins like Fareki? And if we are, they're going to have to be pretty strong in the wind. Um, let's make two sales so that um, we could kind of have one down and the other one up and share them. But then what happened if a really big wind came? You know, they would be a barrier if they were closed weaves. So we needed whole holes in them. So we wove holes in the sails so that a little bit of wind could go through, but they could still catch the wind. And then the weavers from Tararua and that weavers committee spent a whole year making sails. We made two sails between us all. But it wasn't just the sails, of course, there's always more. And Uncle Ross says, well, we need a lot of rope for this waka. We need rope to bind the various components, the wooden components of the waka together. And we need rope for anchors. We need rope for sail ropes, um, a lot of rope, and all different sizes. We needed rope, in fact, also for the sides of the sails to almost make seams on the sails. And Auntie Riddle goes, mocha, mocha, mocha. We're going to make rope out of mocha, which is great 
but we made meters and meters and meters of rope, some as fat as my thumb, and some that we could put on a needle to, to actually plaited that we could put on a needle to stitch up the sails. And we, Ross fortunately actually got the mocha, so we didn't have to strip it, but we had to sort it and untangle it and then plait. And we spent weeks and weeks and weeks. And Auntie Riddle was so talented with, with the mocha. She, she was quite happy to sit there for eight to 10 hours a day, just plaiting mocha and making rope. And that was strong rope. You know, I would doubt that it would ever break. It was amazing, it was really strong rope. And they plaited and plaited and plaited and made rope. And then Auntie Riddle says, Pōtai, these guys are going to be on the waka. They're going to be out in the sun, they need Pōtai. So we all thought, right, we're going to get a bit different here. So some of the Pōtai we made out of kuta and, and some out of kuarare. And we made Pōtai for all the, all the paddlers. And then Ross says, well, they're not, they're not going to wear fabric clothing, so we have to make something out of flax for the guys to wear as well. Well, they weren't so keen on this idea. But anyway, we made maro out of flax. And again, Auntie, Auntie Riddle was so in her element um, with stripping the flax for the, um, for the little skirts, for the little maro for the guys. And oh, some of them got a bit shy and had to have little fabric underpants things on as well. But <laughs> one or two of them didn't. And that was all cool. We kind of, so we made... Um, Portai and, and Maruf, and then we made a few capes as well um, for the paddlers. So just doing things in the old way, um, and without Auntie Martha and, and, and Auntie Totty, we had Lily, Lydia's wonderful skills with weaving as well to complement it all. But it was that base knowledge and that base and I don't even think they knew that they had the knowledge around some of it you know I think it was stuff that came out of them that that just kind of flowed out of them because it was who they were and sometimes Auntie Martha would get humbug about things but I mean who the hell doesn't really you know we all do but she always had that genuineness and and that focus for where it was going to go and and Auntie Totty just just the, the soft, gentle soul that she was. And she was such a humble person, you know, and my son still talks of her and talks of her with, with great warmth um, because she was just had such an araha and open arms always, you know. Um, and, you know, we would bring Kai to her if she wasn't well and, and we'd, we'd try and kind of nurture her a little bit her little fodder out on the, on the main road out there. Um, she, she was a, a really important part of my evolution. And there are a few things about where I am now, I guess, which is part of my indebtedness to this history, is that I've got a very strong conservation focus and really living with the land and caring about the land and the people around the land as well. It's not just the land and, and um, the flora and fauna, but it's, it's, it's also the people as well. That, a lot of that caring came from those early days in getting a sense that this was where iwi Māori were a long time ago as well and feeling that some of that has been lost with many Māori and kind of a sadness that I would really like every Māori to regain that connection with the land as they used to have. And through weaving, this is such an amazing way to do it. You know, just learning, learning to care about the flax bush so that you can keep harvesting. Learning to harvest from the hōhere tree so it doesn't die. Learning to harvest from the kia kia so it doesn't die, but so you can go back and you can get the gift again from there. That is learning to care. And if you can learn to care about those kind of things, it transposes into caring about your kids, caring about your neighbours, caring about the animals around you. It's just part of a journey. And for me, that's, I think, 
that connection in those early days with Te Rarua Marae has been really important for where I am now. So we opened up the Paripiri Toy 2010, Pau. So it's a place we still have lots of weaving, monthly weaving where people come and go. A lot of learners come on board, they go on to other, on to another level. Some just come to learn Kete and then they move up. But to me, that's all good. But around about the same time, because, because of the interest, we started saying, well, really, what about looking at hosting a national hui here? So that for Karo, we worked on that for Karo, and we decided, okay, 2015, we will host the national hui here at Roma Marae in Nahipara. There's been so much weaving in this area because the Taitokero is renowned throughout the motu for fine weavers up this way. I said, well, really, we've got to acknowledge some of these weavers, the weavers past. So we've created, this is how we've come about to organising this exhibition of honouring those past weavers on, of Muri Finua. And this time next year, we will honour Auntie Flory, Auntie Sana Murray and Lydia, Lydia Smith. Because again, they're up in another level, they're up closer to Toi Māori. So we'll do that next year. So this year, it's about these ones.